Well, welcome to the Cinnabar. Today we're working on a really interesting early American revolver. This one's from the Civil War era, this 31 caliber Cooper Firearms Manufacturing Company revolver. Now, at first blush you might look at it and say, well, it looks just like a Colt. And, and it does resemble the, the pocket variety Colt, say like this pocket police Colt, or it looks a whole bunch like this uh, pocket navy. In fact, uh, if you look at them side by side, if it wasn't for the little extra barrel length on that Colt, you'd think they were almost twins. Um, but th this revolver has a feature that neither of these old Colts has, and that's its double action. Okay, so that makes this one of the earliest American double action revolvers made. And it, this one's a, a dandy. It's in very nice shape. Doesn't have a lot of, of finish left on it, but just a really nice tight gun that hasn't been beat up and abused. But it has one problem. See, when we, when we cycle the action, we don't get the trigger to return on its own. We have to push it on our own. So this was brought to me by the curator of the Cody Firearms Museum, Danny Michael, who, who asked me to take a look at it. Uh, it belongs to a really nice gentleman that volunteers there at the museum. And he had it into a, a very well-known and, and really highly regarded gunsmith there in Wyoming who, who worked it over and, and tried to get it working and, and uh, just got the best of him and he, he gave up on it. So I'm not sure that uh, I have a great deal of confidence that I can get it running, but I'm going to give it my best shot and I thought I'd invite you folks to come along. So without further ado, let's kind of get into it and see what we're up against. All right, so we've got this revolver taken apart now right down to this trigger guard here and when we get it off then we hopefully we'll be able to see why this trigger isn't returning. Okay, so looks like right here we've got a kind of a slot here with nothing in it and there's a notch in the trigger there so it looks like there's some kind of a v-spring and unfortunately it's not there um, really a tough thing to to make a spring when you don't have the original to go by kind of as a template let's see yeah there's where it, where it sat in this groove or notch in the trigger guard here so we've got a v-spring that that sits between the frame and, and that notch there and gets compressed by the trigger guard it looks like right in there so um, looks like we're gonna make a v-spring I, I, uh, I don't like v-springs but sometimes you just don't have a choice we also found when we took this thing apart that the mainspring this isn't an original mainspring somebody's made a, a homemade one and it's missing one of the ears where it, where it hooks into the the uh, stirrup here so we're going to have to either make or come up with a mainspring as well so we've got a work cut out for us with some spring making coming up so after doing a little research i found that there was a company that has these Cooper return springs on their website, um, some originals that probably were left over from uh, Bannermans or something like that, but they've recently sold out of them, so they're on back order, and of course, since the Cooper Firearms Manufacturing Company went out of business in 1869, I think might be waiting a while, but we did get kind of a grainy picture here of what they're supposed to look like, and I guess... Uh, it, that's better than nothing. That's going to give us kind of an idea. You can see we've got a, a V-spring and, and one leg's a little bit longer than the other. We've got a little bit of curve here. So it's just going to be a really kind of a difficult task, but we've got at least something to go by here. Now I found some spring stock here that, that looks about right. It might be a little bit on the thin side, but it's really hard to tell from here because this looks like a pretty big spring, but of course this is a very small little area that it goes into. And so our spring stock here is a little bit too wide to go into that notch in the trigger where it belongs. So we're gonna have to narrow this up a little bit and just doing some quick measurements um, 
it looks like this this piece is about 185 thousandths and we need to narrow it up to about 150 thousandths to fit there and I'm going to cut a couple of pieces off and make a couple of springs because this is going to be trial and error and I wouldn't be surprised if the first one doesn't work and hopefully the second one does. Okay so now we'll narrow up this piece of spring steel And we'll get that out of there, cut it in two, and we'll have our pieces to try to make a couple of springs with. <laughs> so here's this grainy picture of our original spring. And we can see that one leg is a little longer than the other. And then there's a gap in between here, about the same thickness as the spring stock that they used to make that spring. So here's our setup. What we've done, we've taken uh, our, our little piece of spring steel here and we clamped it to a, a, a steel plate that's about the same thickness as the spring steel itself. We're going to heat it up here and then we're going to use this steel plate to form and leave that gap in there. So let's get her heated up and see how it goes. And we'll get a little more heat. steel is normalized. It hasn't been hardened and heat treated yet. So we could bend it by hand, but we introduce a lot of stress. So I just like to, to heat them up when we're going to bend them into a V like that. Keep it from being quite, introducing quite so much stress. Because these, these things like to break anyway, even when you do everything just about right. You need to keep it really straight. I think we've done a pretty good job there, but now we need to squeeze it down a little bit, right in that corner. So I'm going to introduce quite a little bit of heat to it. And then before it has a chance to cool down, really put a squeeze on it. I may have to get some vice grips to do that properly. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we've got our spring and our backup spring here. And it's time to see just how close we are to fit. Now that spring is going to sit right down in this recess in the frame here. And let's see how she goes. The end of it goes into a little notch in the trigger. And we can see that it's it's a little too long. Looks like by about 150 thousandths. And I intentionally left it long. It's much easier to shorten them up than it is to uh, try to stretch them out. So we'll have to grind a little bit off of this leg, about 150 thousandths. And let's see, the other leg sits, it's kind of hard to see maybe, but right in this groove right here on the bottom of the trigger guard. So let's see if we're anywhere in the ballpark there. And it looks like we're pretty darn close with that one. So we may not have to, to uh, shorten that one at all. So let's go uh, grind that one leg off and we'll see how close we are. All right, now we've got this leg ground down to where it's gonna fit in the frame. We can see here, we put it in where it belongs here and there she goes. Now we did have to squeeze that corner down just a little bit to get the trigger guard on. It wasn't quite fitting that way, but now we've got it to where it uh, fits under here and everything looks good to go. So our next step, we have to uh, bend these legs now. You can see the, the original here, we had a, a bend in both legs and we're gonna have to put those in. We don't have to heat it. We'll just bend those out and then it's time for our heat treat. I've done the very best I can to replicate this flat spring based on a grainy photograph off the internet. 
but we can't test it until it's been hardened. You see now it's in a soft state and if we put it in the gun and cycle it, it's just going to bend and not spring back. So we need to harden this thing and temper it and then we'll give it a test. Now in order to harden this spring, we're going to have to get it up to a bright red color and then quench it in oil. Now if you're a fan of Forge and Fire, you've seen this done many times with knives and swords and things like that. With these thin springs, of course, it doesn't take a lot of heat till we get them cherry red, or not beyond cherry red, to bright red. We're going to use a slightly carburizing flame, so we're, we're leaving our, our little feather out there a little bit longer than we would if we were cutting. And we're not using a whole lot of gas. In fact, that's probably too much, so we'll adjust that back. And it do, doesn't take long to get hot. One of the problems we have with springs when we're doing this is we can go beyond and melt them real real quick like if we're not paying attention and just that fast we're at the color we need to be and fumbling around and we'll put a little more heat in it make sure that it's even and that's all there is to that now we've got a temper it because now it's it's very very hard but it's also very very brittle and if we were to work that spring now it would just snap real quickly all right now we've got a hardened spring but it's just as brittle as can be and it's going to break if we try to flex it so we need to add a little softness back into the metal and that's what we do with the tempering process now we can temper a couple of different ways um, we could temper this with a torch get it up to a, a kind of a pretty blue color there and um, let it cool back off but that's difficult with with thin springs it's hard to to get to just the right temperature without going over and softening it too much where it's not going to work we can also if you're a bullet caster you can heat up your your lead pot to around 600 to 650 degrees just drop it in your lead it'll float there on that lead and and uh, temper it that way if you're if you're fortunate enough to have a, a heat treat kiln like like we do here uh, that's that's the best method of course we'll, we'll put this spring in the in the heat treat kiln and actually I got a couple other springs here out of um, Colt Lightning revolvers that are were kind of mismanufactured so we had to reconfigure those and we've hardened those and they need to be tempered and we'll just put them in here we'll, we'll, we'll turn the kiln up to about 650 degrees let it slowly come up to temperature when it gets up to temperature then shut it down let it slowly go back down to temperature and that's the best way to um, temper these springs all right now we're to the singular most nerve-wracking part of gunsmithing testing out a spring that you just spent a bunch of time making now either it's going to work perfectly and you're going to be so relieved or it goes snap and you start all over again. Now one of the biggest challenges with this particular spring is trying to figure the exact angle or bend in each of these legs. If we don't get it right, we're going to have to heat it up, re-bend it, heat treat and temper it all over again. And reading the notes from the previous gunsmith who hadn't been able to make one work um, sounded like his biggest difficulty was, was getting enough tension to get the uh, trigger to return all the way. So if anything, we may have to, to bend this one, make it a little more aggressive. Now one of the issues we have with this particular style is you can see this leg sticks up a long ways and we're going to have to compress that. And what we compress it with is the trigger guard. So if we, if we have that bent too far up, we're going to have a devil of a time uh, getting this spring to compress so let's see see that there's where we are when we start we've got a lot of a lot of compression to do to this particular trigger guard now nice thing about this one is is that it has a little notch in the front of the trigger that's going to hold that trigger guard in place a little bit while we try to get the screws in we don't have to compress it with the screws Okay, so let's see if we can get this to go all the way in and line up properly while we're compressing that spring. We don't have it quite yet. You've got to have three or four hands to do this, I think.
There we go. I always tighten the back one first and then in this case just kind of finger tight and then go to the front screw to compress that spring the rest of the way. And of course I'm holding it at a kind of an odd angle so that you might see what we're, we're trying to accomplish here. Okay, we'll go ahead and put the rest of this revolver together and test it out now. So actually we don't have to put this whole revolver back together to test it out. We'll just put this mainspring in it and cycle it and keep our fingers crossed and hope for the best. Okay. Get it good and tight. And here we go. We'll do it in single action. There's a safe notch or load notch, half cock, full cock, and let it down. Hey, looky there, it returned. I love it. It's made one cycle now. <laughs> if it's going to break, usually it's in that first test, of course, so. I'm, I'm very, very pleased. Let's try it again. Hey, looks like it works. Success. Now we just have to um, come up with a, with a new mainspring. This one is actually working, but as I showed earlier, it's got one ear broken off of it. So we'll uh, go to our next step now and see what, what we can't do to come up with a mainspring that works. Now it's time to deal with this homemade mainspring that has the, the one ear broke off where, where it hooks into the stirrup. And you know, it works this way, but of course, um, you know, its days are probably numbered putting all the stress on that one side. So we've got it as a template and it, it's not a factory spring, but that's as close as we've got to, to go by. And we could make ones from scratch with a piece of spring steel like this one, and we may end up doing that. But it's a long process to, to, to try to thin this one out and make the, the hooks for the stirrup and, and all that. Um, so we kind of look through some, some other mainsprings and find that a mainspring for a 1877 Colt Lightning or Thunderer is dimensionally almost identical to this Cooper mainspring. Um, it does need to have a different profile. See, the, the curve is quite a little bit different. The, the bottom will need to, to grind a little bit off of the bottom to get that to fit down here, but really not a big job. If we can make that work, it's going to save us a lot of time over trying to make one from scratch uh, out of this piece of spring steel. Alright, now we're going to have to heat up this spring. We're going to have to change the angle, straighten the arc just a little bit right in this area, increase the arc in this area, and then we may have to come back and change the angle right here where it hooks into the stirrup. Um, but we'll see after we get the first two bends. So let's uh, get a little heat going in this thing. And we'll see if our uh, little propane torch will do the job. If not, then we'll have to go to acetylene. The area that we're going to bend up to a cherry red, or actually a little beyond cherry red. Now we're going to see a red color. A little bit more. We've got a broken spring here to use as a template. Oops. 
just about right. Okay, now we'll go on to the next bend a little further up. That one didn't take much, but we're going to have to bend this one quite a little bit more. And the spring's a lot thinner up here. This is why we really didn't want to use the settling to start with. Because it would be easy to get it maybe too hot. A map gas cylinder, maybe a couple hundred degrees hotter than the, the, the propane torch. Might be just about right, but I didn't have a map gas cylinder. There we go. And we'll compare it to our not ways to go yet. Okay, after that initial try at getting it just the right angle, um, all right, now after that initial try, getting just the right curve on this thing, we had to go back and, and heat it and tweak it a little bit several times to get everything just right. And I think we're really close now. Um, we've had it in and tried a couple of times, but we still didn't have quite enough tension on the hammer at rest. And so, and every time we do that, then we have to heat it up, let it cool off, try it here in the in the gun and then go back heat it up again tweak it just a little bit it is a or can be a frustrating and, and kind of a time-consuming process okay so there we we got it in and oh yeah there we go we weren't getting that uh, pressure to, to get that hammer to, to uh, set home in place with a little tension on it so now we're, we've got everything lined up really good and I think we're ready to go now the problem is is when we we heat it to to adjust the the tension or or the curve on this spring we also normalize that spring in other words we take the heat treat and the temper out of it so now it acts just like mild steel and if we were to to cycle this all the way or to load that spring it would just bend and stay in place so now we've got to go back and heat treat and temper it just like we did on this rebound spring here Alright, so now we're up to the point where we get to test our heat, treat, and temper on this modified Colt Lightning mainspring. And as luck would have it, a mainspring screw from a Colt Lightning fits perfectly and is the right thread size for this too. The, the screw that was in it was kind of a homemade one and pretty weak threads and it's really easy to strip out the threads on these uh, trigger guards. That are, uh, brass or gun metal or actually a bronze alloy and they're really soft so um, having a new brand new screw with good threads is a good deal okay so everything lines up properly let's give it a try before we put the gun back together hey there we go so we now we've got a a good rebound spring and a good main spring and we ought to be able to put this this old revolver back together and work like a charm. I don't like to dry fire them or I would. Uh, we'll, we'll keep it from dry firing and just... There we go. Okay, so now we're down to putting on the cylinder. The front half. This one's good and tight. And our wedge and there we are. Everything working properly. All right, now for just one final check, we've put a used cap on one of these chambers and we'll give it a, a shot in double action. 
All right, there we go. I think that mainsprings may be a little weak. We might have to go back and reconfigure it and give it a little more tension. Um, but we've got two new springs in this thing that seem to be functioning. Neither one of them went snap when we first started. Now, if, you, if you're in a position, you've got to have a Smith make you a spring. One of the things you've got to understand is that it is a time-consuming process. Um, and a lot of times it's the second or third spring that that actually works so you know keep in mind when you get the bill that uh, it wasn't just a simple little project it takes a lot of skill and a lot of time and sometimes to make two or three of them before they they actually work correctly now, this is a great old revolver i mean talk about interesting a civil war era double action revolver now we've got a new trigger return spring made for this old revolver We've got a, a mainspring made up for it, and after a couple of tries, I think we've got it configured just right. And then we had a couple of other issues we needed to fix with this revolver, and one was that uh, it just wasn't indexing up all the way. We weren't getting that bolt up into the cylinder notches, so we did have to work on the timing some. And then it had a lot of end shake in it. And the owner does want to test fire this at some point, so we really need to take that end shake out. And I think we've got it pretty well tight now. So we're going to just see if it'll it'll fire a percussion cap we're not going to test fire it but we're going to give this a try in, in double action mode and there we go a uh, civil war era double action percussion revolver it's ready for action well i hope you've enjoyed today's episode until next time happy trails from the cinnabar